Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the November edition of Outline, our last edition of 2021. Um, today, we will be talking about SIL and, uh, and trying to make sense of the dark art that, that is SIL. And I'm joined today by two uh, willing or less willing volunteers to try and talk about SIL. Um, firstly, Peter Clausen, a senior associate in the planning team, and uh, Tobias Paul, uh, an associate in the team. And, and both Peter and Tobias have been probably more involved with the SIL regs for a number of clients over the last few weeks and months than they would have liked. So we've, we've got fresh, fresh knowledge and experience that they're going to, to share with us today. Uh, my name's Trevor Ivory. I'm the uh, head of the planning team here at DLA Piper. Um, and uh, let, let, without any further ado, let, let's get underway. It, Start perhaps with a with a bit of a recap of, of SIL. Why why, why do we have it? Um, is a, is a question I often ask myself. And uh, you have to go back to the Planning Act two thousand and eight um, to to see the uh, the beginnings of SIL. It was introduced by the uh, the, the then Labour government um, as part of the Planning Act two thousand and eight. But but there was quite a gestation period before that. Um, th those of you who who are, who are as old as me will remember. Um, before SIL, there was a concept um, that was touted by the government of planning gain supplement, um, which I seem to recall at the time, the government were quite determined absolutely was not a tax, um, although other than the fact it was called planning gain supplement, it always looked to me rather like development land tax um, had, had once looked. That planning gain supplement was intended to be a complete replacement for section 106, but I think the, the, the problem that, that the government had with it was, was how you deal with on-site infrastructure provision um, if you abolish 106 and turn it completely into a tax. So, so out of that difficulty was born the community infrastructure levy. Again, it absolutely was not a tax, I seem to recall being told at the time, although again, it rather looks like a tax, um, but, uh, but it, is, it is a levy, I'm sure we'll all, we'll all agree. Um, but, but I think it, the, it was a messy compromise, it seems to me, from the beginning. It was, it was trying to move towards that development land tax type approach. Um, but without losing some of the best bits of Section 106. And, and that messy compromise um, probably um, is still evident in, in the regulations today. The, the, the first regulations we got with the detail of the system were the Community Infrastructure Levy Regulations of 2010. Um, and, and actually, it, to, to my mind, I, I, from the start, they were unnecessarily complicated. They were inflexible and, and really, really bureaucratic. Um, and at the time, I was fairly relaxed because it seemed it was going to be short-lived. The, uh, the, the then um, Conservative opposition under David Cameron, in a, in a document some of you may remember, Open Source Planning, which had such choice ideas as 30 third-party rights of appeals and other crazy nonsense that fortunately never saw the light of day. But one of the good ideas, I thought, in that document was the proposal to, to abolish SIL, but uh, it never quite happened. And after several governments, um, we, we still have the system with us. Um, having said that, the, uh, the, the criticisms that people made at the time um, were, were, were clearly of some merit because actually it's quite remarkable, it seems to me, that, that despite the regulations only having been introduced in 2010, they have been amended 13 separate times um, in the intervening 11 years. And that's e even, even by sloppy parliamentary standards, that's quite remarkable if, you, uh, if you've had to have 13 new goes at trying to get it right. And I'm prepared to bet we won't stop at 13 times. I'm prepared to bet there are more amendments yet to, yet to come. Some of those issues and some of that complexity has inevitably ended up before the courts. Um, and that's what we're going to look at today is look at some of the, uh, the, the more interesting court decisions that we've had in the last few years on how the SIL regulations work um, and, and what lessons we can take from those and how those cases can help us in trying to understand um, what, what the regulations are doing and, and how they're supposed to be doing it. Um, I, I, we'll be talking about a number of cases uh, as we go along. As usual, um, those of you that are watching the live broadcast, we will follow up with an email setting out all the references to the cases we talk about so that if you are so minded, a little bit of uh, time over Christmas and you fancy reading the cases, you're, you're able to do so. Likewise, if you're watching us on the YouTube channel, um, then the cases will all be detailed in the, uh, in, in the, in the, 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 the blurb next to on the screen. 
so, so let, let's get underway. And I think probably the first place to start, it seems to me, is, is notices. Um, and, and Tobias, I'm going to come to you first, if I can. There are a remarkable number of notices that need to be served under the SIL regime, are there not? Uh, yes, and uh, I think as we go through the discussion, we'll uh, work out um, <laughs> some of the uh, many issues which people have uh, encountered when uh, attempting to serve them and attempting to complete them. Um, somewhat weirdly, you can actually sort of set out the how the process is supposed to work quite simply. Um, so the idea is that you make a planning application, or you're proposing to carry out permitted development. Um, obviously. If you make a planning application, the local planning authority knows about that. Um, and if you're proposing to carry out permitted development, then there's a separate form you fill out to tell the council that we're proposing to do some permitted development. The idea is that uh, the local authority can then establish what's the new floor area that you're going to create. And then they can calculate, so how much per square meter um, is that going to be for the actual sill itself? Um, and once they've done that, then uh, as soon as the planning permission has been granted, um, then as soon as reasonably uh, possible, they issue what's called a liability notice. Um, and what that does is it sets out the overall total sum of SIL, which is attached to or connected with that particular grant of planning permission. Then, if you actually decide to implement the planning permission, you have to provide to the council uh, a commencement notice. Um, and in effect, what that does is, first of all, it says we are commencing this particular planning, uh, planning permission. Um, and also, you have to tell the council in advance what day you are proposed to start work. Um, that then allows the council to issue what's called a demand notice. Um, and there can be uh, one demand notice or multiple demand notices uh, because uh, there are certain uh, ways in which you uh, divvy up the total amount of SIL. So, for example, it's possible for a single person to assume liability to pay. There's a form for that. Um, it's possible for more than one person to assume liability to pay, in which case they're jointly and separately liable. Um, and if no one assumes liability to pay, then the uh, SIL uh, liability defaults to the uh, landowners. Generally speaking, we're talking freeholders and uh, people who have long leases. Um, and uh, the uh, SIL amount, if it needs to be divided up, is based on the relative um, values of the different interests in the land. Once the demand notices have been issued, um, they will also set out um, when you need to pay. So some local planning authorities have an instalment policy um, and there are various provisions in the regulations which provide for default provisions to give you various payment periods. Uh, normally the payment periods are rather tight, um, typically within a month or two months. Um, so uh, even if it allows you to sort of postpone paying half of your 10 million pounds of SIL, then I suppose it's better for you to have 5 million pounds in your bank account for another month than in the councils if you're a developer. Um, that's broadly how it's supposed to work. Um, I suppose one other thing which uh, will come out in the cases is it is possible for the local planning authority to reissue the liability and demand notices. Um, if, for example, the development changes in some way through a variation um, or in some circumstances, if the council messed up the initial calculation. Um, and uh, if that happens, then the new notice supersedes the original one. Um, as I said, that's the sort of simple summary of how it's supposed to work. <laughs> and, and, and these various notices, there are prescribed forms, I think, Peter, are there in, in, in the regulations. And actually, the cases tell us it's pretty important to use the prescribed form and indeed to get the content right. And we've seen that we've seen that in a couple of cases, I think, haven't we? Yeah, that's right, Trevor. I, I think one of the things that that we've learned from the SIL regulations is that they're actually, well, to put it kindly, they're rather inflexible, and so the courts have almost been forced to to interpret them accordingly. And, and as you said, Trevor, in the case of notices, if the regulations provide that you need to use a prescribed form in order to effectively serve a notice, then it seems that nothing other than that prescribed notice will suffice. Um, the first case sort of that emphasizes that point is, is the Shropshire case from 2019. Uh, this concerned an individual called Mr. Jones, who'd obtained planning permission for a house that he then intended to, to build for himself. 
He applied for the self-build housing exemption under the civil regulations and was granted it, um, which basically exonerated him of a total civil liability in the sum of £38,000. He then duly sent an email to the council to notify them of his intended date for commencing the development and started his development accordingly. Now, under the SIL regs, as they were drafted in 2019, the self-build exemption was lost if you failed to serve a commencement notice before the day on which the chargeable development was commenced. The court held that the SIL regulations were, were very prescriptive as to what amounted to a valid commencement notice. So, for example, under Regulation 69, the commencement notice must be in writing on a form published by the Secretary of State. It's got to identify the liability notice to which it relates, um, and, and it's also got to address the other particulars that are referred to in the form. Ultimate, ultimately here, uh, an email wasn't sufficient for these purposes, and so unfortunately for, for Mr Jones, the court held that because he'd failed to serve a valid, a valid commencement notice, he'd actually lost his right to any self-build exemption under the regulations, and so was liable, um, sadly for him, to, to pay the full SIL amount. Now, I should probably say that the Secretary of State, who was the unsuccessful defendant in that claim, clearly didn't like the decision, um, because just months later, the regulations were amended for, for as you said tre earlier, Trevor, the umpteenth time, uh, to remove the provision which stripped a developer of their right to the self-build exemption if they hadn't served a, a valid notice prior to commencement. Um, Whilst that amendment perhaps makes the regulations less cutthroat for, for self-build developers, the requirement for a valid commencement notice is still very much a real one. And so the principle that the notice needs to comply with the specifics of the regulation still applies. Of course, the lack of a valid notice still leads to surcharges being incurred. And so Mr. Jones's invalid notice would have still come under scrutiny, albeit less severely. Uh, the second case I just wanted to quick, quickly run, run past you is, is a challenge to a planning inspector's decision to an accept appeal. The developer here was, was seeking to appeal against surcharges the council had imposed in its purported demand notice. Um, on receipt of that notice, the developer queried it with the council, who later replied with a breakdown of the surcharges it had imposed. The developer then submitted an appeal upon receipt of the letter, although it was technically out of time to submit that appeal if the clock had started running from the date the purported demand notice was originally served. Now, the planning inspector originally rejected the appeal on the basis that it was out of time, um, but subsequently accepted it um, on, on the grounds that the original demand notice was deficient for not complying with the requirements of the notice under the SIL regs. Uh, it didn't contain a breakdown of the surcharges, nor did it advise the developer of its right to appeal against the notice. Uh, this, this all went to court and, and the court upheld the inspectorate's decision advi and advised that basically either the, the appeal could continue notwithstanding the defective notice or that the authority could, could issue a compliant notice, which would restart the appeal clock and give the developer the opportunity to attend that appeal instead. And so, so Peter, those two cases, they sort of demonstrate that whilst the regulations are strict, it cuts both ways, doesn't it? That if you're the developer, you've got to do it right. But if you're the LPA, you've also got to have your paperwork in order. Yeah, exactly. So I, and I think that's, that's come across in, in, in various appeal decisions and, and certainly in the case law. It, 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 the, the, the two cases that I've just, just spelled out, I just go to show that the form and content of the notice has to be right um, it, it, and sort of verbatim in, in the context of the SIL regulations. And it, for, for me, the, the Shropshire case is particularly interesting, I think, because it's um, it, it, quite often if you've got a development, there will be obligations under the section 106 to serve a commencement notice. There may be other obligations kicking around as well that, that, that are there. And, and I think the point that we've got to take away from that is just because you served a commencement notice under the section 106, um, you've still got to go through that paperwork. You've got to send the right form if you're, um, if you're not at risk of losing some of those exemptions from, from SIL, uh, which, which does seem, I agree with you, Peter, it seems quite harsh, but it is the way that the regulations are worded. And it's interesting the the government have given a bit more flexibility to self-builders, presumably because by definition, they're not going to be as familiar with the system. But for the rest of us, um, don't rely on the fact that you've by other means told the planning authority that you're commencing and assume that's enough for SIL because you, 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 you may well get punished. <laughs> 
as Mr. Jones did. Yeah, and, and, to, and Tobias, I think it, your point, it, it cuts both ways. I, I think that's an interesting one because we probably see that on the point about the timing of the notices. If we sort of take that, that a little bit further, um, you've talked about this actually on an earlier outline. Um, certainly one of, one of the two cases um, that, that uh, I think look at the importance of timing, but, but you just want to sort of remind us on, on that case and also talk, talk about the, um, the, 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 the more recent case that, again, I think makes that point that time is of the essence, as we lawyers would say. Uh, yes, Trevor. Um, so so the, the, the case which sort of um, was handed down by the court uh, about six months ago, so earlier this year, it was a case called um, uh, Trent against Hartsmere uh, Council. Um, unfortunately for the council, Mrs. Trent was a solicitor who specialised in um, uh, bringing legal challenges against local authorities. Um, otherwise, it would probably, in most cases, never have ever got to court. Um, but um, in effect, what had happened is uh, Mrs. Trent um, had uh, wanted her sort of uh, relatively frail parents to move next door to her. So she bought the house next door. She applied for planning permission to demolish it and rebuild it for something more suitable. Um, and while the planning application was live, the council sent her copies of the various SIL forms that she needed to fill out um, to claim, in effect, uh, an exemption which applied to that type of development. Um, they also sent her a copy of the form to assume liability, which you had to complete in order to benefit from the exemption. Um, as it happens, Mrs. Trent filled out the exemption paperwork but did not fill out the uh, assumption of liability form. So technically speaking, she hadn't qualified for the exemption at all. Um, the planning permission was granted in 2017. And depending on who you ask, the local planning authority says that it created a liability notice for the SIL of about 16 and a half thousand pounds and that they emailed it to Mrs. Trent. Uh, if you ask Mrs. Trent, she heard nothing from the council until 2019, when someone from the planning department realised that she'd started work and that there was £16,500. Could they have it, please? Um, the council issued a demand notice saying, you started work, we need the £16,500. Oh, and also, you didn't fill out the paperwork properly, so we'll have some surcharges as well, please. Uh, Mrs. Trent... Um, went through the uh, appeal process in the regulations um, and her appeal was accepted. Um, this was uh, initially um, on the grounds that the surcharges weren't payable because the council had never actually issued the liability notice properly. Um, but in passing, the appeal inspector commented that because the council had taken um, the best part of uh, two and a half years to actually issue the notices, um, they hadn't issued the notices as soon as reasonably possible, and therefore he didn't think the liability notice would have been valid when they actually then sent her another copy because it was too late. Um, the council nevertheless issued a new demand notice for £16,500, which Mrs Trent paid on sufferance. Mrs Trent then took the council to court <laughs> for purporting to issue the new demand notice. And her argument was that planning permission was granted in, uh, 2060, in 2017, never received a liability notice from you until uh, 2019, 2020. Um, and therefore, because you left it for three years, that wasn't issued as soon as possible. Your liability notice does not comply with the regulations. And in effect, that what Mrs. Trent was getting at was the liability notice is the start of the process. If the council doesn't get that right, then every other step follows on from the liability notice. If there's no liability notice, she can't submit a valid commencement notice. Therefore, the council can't submit a valid demand notice and so on down the line. Um, Mrs. Trent was successful. The court upheld her challenge um, and it's in effect what the court said was as soon as reasonably possible whilst there may be some margin there three years later is obviously not as soon as reasonably possible um, the court also um, it was a rather interesting in terms of the remedy it gave her the court said it was not going to order the council to repay the money because it expected the council to repay it voluntarily um, which is uh, something that judges uh, do when it's a sort of a heavy hint to the council to uh, you've got to cut a check. 
Whether Mrs. Trent has ever actually got her money back, I don't know. <laughs> Um, but uh, again, this, uh, this, this was sort of a, a very uh, interesting case where timing was critical and because the council was late and didn't do it right, um, that's £16,500 that otherwise Mrs Trent would have probably actually had to pay. And that, that does, sorry to pass before you go on to your next case, but actually that comes up remarkably frequently and certainly, I know P Peter, you, you dealt with a a site recently where where the the delay was actually it made it made hearts mirror with mrs trent look quite swift didn't it but um <laughs> it, so, it, it, it is it is one to uh, it is one for people to keep in mind if planning authorities aren't quick to serve those notices then there, there is that opportunity to, to to sort of pause and scrutinize it and question whether actually the whole liability of sill has has fallen away um, which yeah. would be uh, unfortunate for a planning authority but no doubt Good news to the uh, to, to the landowner and the developers ears. I completely agree, Trevor. And it, it, it almost goes back to Tobias's earlier point that, that it cuts both ways. It, it, the onus is not only on the developer but also on on the local planning authority. And it's almost like a game of ping pong in in that respect that that what one needs to lead on to the other. Sorry, Tobias. Ca carry on because I think we, there, there's an, there's another case that that, that um, tells us again that time is important, isn't there? Yes, well, you know that legislation is working well when you get not one, but two cases in close proximity. <laughs> um, so so th this case, um, actually, the, the householder, unfortunately, uh, didn't end up in quite as happy a position as Mrs. Trent. So uh, this is a more recent case called uh, Gardner against Hartsmere Borough Council. Uh, the same local planning authority as Mrs. Trent, as it happened. So maybe we're seeing a theme here. Um, but um, I do have quite a lot of sympathy for Mr. Gardner in some respects. Um, so he had applied for planning permission to build a, an extension on his house, a very large extension. Um, however, uh, in this particular local planning authorities area, their charging schedule for still, um, in effect, exempted uh, residential extensions. So there was a sort of uh, nothing to pay per square meter, as it were. So uh, you have to, the, you are, you must pay nothing, um, and if you don't do the paperwork right, you have to pay more. Um, in this particular case, uh, Mr. Gardner's uh, architect and builders started work um, and started uh, demolishing the house. Um, and uh, after this work had been progressing merrily, um, someone from the planning department decided to pop around and have a look at what was going on. Um, it, the law report is not entirely clear as to exactly why someone from the planning department decided to investigate. Um, but um, ultimately, the uh, planning authority took the position that the works that he had done went so far beyond the minor demolition to build the extension that he hadn't actually implemented the planning permission at all. What he had done is he had demolished his house without planning permission. <laughs> So he ended up in the situation where he had no planning permission for the extension and, because, and, and no house because it's been demolished and he can't implement the planning permission because there's no house to extend anymore. Um, what then happened was the local planning authority didn't have any particular in principle objection to what he wanted to do. The end result would still be much the same. Um, so uh, he submitted a retrospective planning application, um, which was approved. Um, so lucky Mr. Gardner. Um, unfortunately for Mr. Gardner, um, the local planning authority then um, issued him with a liability notice for the sill for a new house, um, which was substantial, um, and a demand notice saying, pay up please. Uh, Mr. Gardner was uh, understandably somewhat aggrieved at this because uh, his view was that this is a self-built house, I'm living in it myself, and therefore it's exempt from sill. Um, so he brought a legal challenge. Um, uh, ultimately, his legal challenge was not successful, and um, uh, in effect, the reason for that is because of the way that the court analysed the regulations. Uh, and this goes back to your point, uh, sort of at the start of the session, Trevor, about it. It's definitely not a tax. It's not a tax. But what the court said was, but we'll interpret the legislation as if it was a tax, um, and so we'll see what actually does the legislation require. The problem for Mr Gardner is that when you actually look at the precise wording of the regulations, he encountered a number of issues which meant that in his circumstances he couldn't actually benefit from the exemption. Um, the first problem is that um, the, reg the exemption itself is in Regulation 54A, 
Um, but that just says that a person is eligible for an exemption. It doesn't actually create the exemption. And that was something which the court focused on quite a lot. So the fact that it's self-built housing does not in and of itself mean that you get the SIL exemption. Um, you then have to look at Regulation 54B, which sets out the procedure to actually claim the exemption. Um, uh, Mr. Gardner had actually made a claim. <laughs> um, unfortunately for him, uh, the way that the uh, claims process is worded, um, it own, a claim can only be made by someone who intends or to build a house or intends to commission someone else to build a house for his own uses. It's forward looking. Because he'd made a retrospective planning application, he'd already started work, um, then he could not actually make a valid claim because he wasn't eligible to do it because he didn't intend to build a house, he'd already started work. Uh, there was another issue for him in that um, whilst he said he'd made a claim for the exemption um, in time, um, because it was a retrospective planning application, there is actually an interpretive provision in the front part of the regulations, which says that if you've got a retrospective planning permission under section 73A of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990, you are deemed to have commenced work on the day that the planning permission is granted. And the reason that was important is that, again, in order to claim the exemption, you have to assume liability to pay the SIL, even though in this case you're applying for the exemption, so you don't have to pay anything. Um, the problem for Mr. Gardner is that you can only assume liability to pay in respect of a chargeable development, and that's a defined term in the regulations. Um, and in fact, what the court found was that the chargeable development is the development for which planning permission has been granted. So you can only validly assume liability to pay after the planning permission is granted. Um, now, this may potentially cause an issue for some local planning authorities which like to get the assumption of liability notice um, completed when the planning application is still being processed. Um, so there's no definitive case on actually, is that a valid practice at all? Um, so we may see some more litigation on this. Um, the problem for Mr. Gardner is that because you couldn't assume liability to pay until after the planning permission was granted, but because as soon as it was granted, he was assumed to have commenced it, there's then another regulation in Regulation 31, which um, makes clear that you cannot validly assume liability to pay after commencement. So there was no sort of sliver of time in which he could have actually validly made an application. Um, and so he had to pay. <laughs> So the, the upshot is, if you're doing a, if you're doing a, a retrospective planning application, you're paying one way or the other, regardless of any exemptions or or anything else, um, you're 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 stuck with it, aren't you? A disincentive to starting before your uh, b b before you've got your planning permission, which actually, I mean, there's a very real point there, um, not necessarily retrospective planning applications, but it is not unheard of if a planning authority is taking a long time to determine an application. It is not unheard of. For, uh, for for development perhaps to begin prior to the uh, to the formal grant or, or of, of planning permission, and that's a a warning to anyone doing that and, to, and looking to uh, to potentially claim exemptions. So well, it, so you say in that case, Tobias, that um, it definitely wasn't a tax, but the court decided to apply tax principles to to its interpretation and and. We've got a case that is very hot off the press, actually, just in the last couple of weeks. Um, the High Court looked at the Stonewater and Wilden case, didn't it, Peter? And actually there, I couldn't help noticing the judge took the same approach. Of, this is a taxation matter and therefore I'll apply taxation principles. So uh, the courts clearly think that um, it may be called a levy, but it rather smells like a tax. But, yeah. but there, were, there were a couple of interesting points in the, in the Stonewater case, weren't there, I think, Peter? Yeah, there were. And before I touch on them, I'll just, I'll just quickly run through the background to the case. So uh, planning permission was uh, originally granted by the council for a residential development uh, for 169 new homes. That permission was, was subject to a Section 106 agreement in the usual way, uh, and, and the agreement itself required 35% of the dwellings to be provided as affordable housing. The site was then later acquired by Stonewater, a national not-for-profit affordable housing provider who wanted to actually provide 100% affordable housing across the site. 
Now, prior to Stonewater acquiring the site, the, the council had issued a liability notice for, for over 3 million. And that was based on the development as it was then uh, and didn't include the, the provision for, for any reliefs or, or exemptions. So immediately on purchasing the site, Stonewater applied to the council for social housing relief across the whole development on the basis that, that all of the housing was now going to be provided uh, as, as affordable. Now, after some toing and froing and, and delay on from the council, uh, while it sought legal advice, uh, amongst other things, the application was eventually refused on the basis that the Section 106 agreement controlled the amount of affordable housing to be provided at the site and limited the provision to just 35 percent. The council argued that there was no ability to, to bring forward the additional affordable housing that Stonewater was proposing. Stonewater challenged the council's refusal, but, but before we go to the court's decision, it's perhaps just wanting, r worth running through the, uh, the, the SIL regulations themselves. So, so part six of the regulations make provision for a, a number of exemptions and relief from SIL, and, and it includes the provision for relief from the levy from, from the provision of social housing, provided that the proposal complies with a number of conditions. Effectively, what, what Stonegate, Stonewater sorry, was, was proposing would satisfy the various conditions and so would qualify for, for the social housing relief. However, Regulation 51, which provides the procedure for claiming that social housing relief, requires evidence to be submitted that the proposed development qualifies for, for the relief. So then uh, the case effectively boiled down to, to two key issues, as Trevor identified earlier. And the first was whether the, the granting of social housing relief under the regulations was mandatory or discretionary. The court held that the relief was mandatory, ultimately provided the various conditions set out in Regulation 49 were met, and by that I mean the conditions as to whether social housing relief was applicable, then relief had to be granted. But as I mentioned earlier, in applying to the council for this relief, it's a requirement to evidence that the housing qualifies for the social housing relief, which brings us on to the second issue. The question before the court was effectively whether the council could rely on the Section 106 agreement to show that Stonewater had not provided sufficient evidence to satisfy the requirements for social housing relief under the SIL regulations. The court found that the question of whether the evidence provided was sufficient is actually a matter for the decision maker themselves, and in doing so, it found in favour of the council, effectively making Stonewater liable for just over £3 million worth of, of SIL. The court held that whilst it's not a requirement for a Section 106 agreement to be submitted as evidence to support a claim, it could certainly be taken into account. Now, in terms of the Section 106 agreement itself, the court did go into some detail looking at, at the language of the agreement, but the key point for the court was that it capped the provision of affordable housing at 35%, with every other dwelling to be provided uh, as a as defined private dwelling unit, no, effectively a, a a dwelling to be sold on the open market. And that the court found that between the, the two very specific definitions, it wasn't then possible to read into the agreement a third definition, which allowed the dwellings to be provided as affordable housing, but which wouldn't actually be caught by any of the affordable housing provisions or indeed um, any relevant market housing provisions. So, so that, that is Stonewater in, in a nutshell. And it, I think it's a, to me, it's an interesting case. And I think so sort of just, just looking at those, those two aspects that you, you've highlighted, Peter, because I, I think you're right, they are the interesting parts. That, that first part, you, is there a discretion on a planning authority as to whether, they, whether, whether you get your relief or not? The answer to that, I think, unsurprisingly, when you've read the regulations, is, is, is no, there isn't. If you, if you are able to meet the criteria, then you are entitled to the, uh, to, to the, to the discretion, but uh, to the relief rather, but um, you've got to prove that they, the dwellings that you're looking for relief on qualify, and that that's yeah. sort of quite fundamental, isn't it? And I think although the court said you don't have to show the 106 as evidence, almost always your evidence that a unit is going to be affordable mm, is exactly. a covenant in the 106 agreement, isn't it, that says you're provided as a, as affordable. But 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 I have to say, sort of on that second part, I, I kind of started off looking at the case feeling that Stonewater had been a little bit hard done by here. You, know, you bought a site, which okay, you could have delivered 65% um, of the units as, um, as market, but you've decided to deliver it all as affordable housing. That feels like you know, a good positive thing to do. And you know, that, that 
you're getting a little bit unstuck when you're then being told you've got to pay a sill liability that you, you'd clearly I assume Stonewater had been assuming they weren't going to have to pay um, and presumably the price they paid for the site and everything else reflected that and I think viability was flagged up wasn't it that um, they they weren't going to be in a position to provide all these units as affordable if they had to do, if they had to provide the sill they were effectively going to have to sell the units on the open market to be able to pay yeah. the, uh, the I nearly said to pay the tax pay the levy <laughs> sorry um, but, but actually, I think when you look at the points about the 106, there, there was a way through, wasn't there, for, for Stonewater that actually, oddly, the planning authority had offered to them at, at one point before getting to court. Yeah, yeah it, it seems to me that, that, that the it, it, a, a simple variation to the, to the 106 so as to allow 100, 100% affordable uh, units just within the definitions of, of the agreement itself would, would have solved the problem. And, and as you say, Trevor, that, that was something that the council offered up, um, but, but Stonewater didn't take, take that offer. Um, and actually, it, during the correspondence, simply repeated its position um, before eventually issuing proceedings. And, and that's sort of where I started to be a little bit less sympathetic, um, to, yeah. to be honest, because I, I can see the local authorities' point there of saying, well, hold on, you're telling me today that you're going to provide this as 100% affordable housing. But actually, there's, there's, I've got no way of enforcing that. You might change your mind tomorrow and you might sell these on the open market because unless there's that legal obligation to deliver them as affordable, yeah, it, then, then, then who knows what you'll do with them once you've, once you've got your exemption. So I, I sort of actually started to, to, to change my sympathies as I was getting into the detail of the case. Likewise, it, it seems to me that Stonewater had a surefire fire way available to them actually to come out with, with the proceedings with their head held high in any event, because they could have just offered a unilateral undertaking as part of the proceedings if they were wrong on the evidence point. So it, it feels to me like there, there, there were some, some hoops that were missed. And it's probably, we, we, we're a dangerous trail of topic, so it's yeah, a very brief observation perhaps, <laughs> but, but, but it seems to me actually that it, it, it was some quite unusual wording in the, in the section 106. I think for me, quite often you would see the affordable dwellings rather than being capped, you, you tend to see sort of words like not less than 35% or, or something a little bit more flexible. And you also wouldn't see a definition of market housing that says it's the other 65%. Quite mm. often you would see the definition of market housing being all of the dwellings that aren't affordable dwellings. And it, it feels to me if that more usual approach to the drafting had occurred, there, there may actually have been perhaps, I still don't think it would have got Stonewater home on saying 100% of it is, is affordable. But, but it, it, some of the court's reasoning wouldn't have been quite so um, quite so categorical, perhaps, if, if that more normal approach to Flexible. drafting a 106 yeah. was in case, was, was yeah, in play. I, I completely agree, yeah. But that, that feels like a section 106, section 106 <laughs> outline yeah. for, for, for 2022, <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll move on from that. But um, I, I think one of the other things um, that, that's probably worth flagging to us, and again, I think we've covered it in an, in an earlier outline, but... Um, but, but phasing is quite often important, particularly when you're dealing with those bigger schemes where the, where the liability is, is significant. Um, there can be some real viability challenges to having to provide all of the SIL um, on or, or very shortly after commencement. So it's quite often important for a developer to be able to phase. And you, you have to be quite careful with your planning permission, don't you, Tobias, in order to make sure that the, the ability to phase SIL is actually open to you when you, when you start to carry out your development. Uh, that's exactly right, Trevor. Um, and, and weirdly, so this particular case is uh, called uh, Oval Estates St Peter's Limited against uh, Bath and North East Somerset Council, so not Hartsville this time. Um, but um, it, 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 it's, it's a slightly weird case as well because it um, actually incorporates quite a lot of the topics that we've been discussing so far. There's a section 106 in the mix, which the developer was trying to sort of pray in aid. Um, there's also a, a timing issue about when the council issued the uh, liability notice. Um, but um, ultimately what had happened is that planning permission had been granted in outline in March 2016. Um, and uh, it was just a, a sort of uh, the usual outline planning permission all matters reserved. Um, that planning permission did not say anything about phasing. There was a section 106 agreement associated with it, which didn't say anything about phasing. So that was sort of a, the court very quickly dispensed with the developer's argument on that point. Um, reserved matters were approved in April 2017, and then for a single complete development. So no phasing. 
Um, and then that is what in theory should have triggered the issue of a liability notice. Scroll forward over two years later, and the council gets round to issuing the liability notice in May 2019. Um, in the intervening period, the developer had, first of all, assumed liability to pay um, and commenced the original development in 2018. Um, but then in 2019, um, the developer obtained a non-material amendment to the planning permission, which uh, required the development to be undertaken in phases. Um, and that was a section 96A uh, variation. It wasn't a new planning permission under section 73. Um, again, the developer was slightly aggrieved that he was being asked to pay all of the sill up front because he was somewhat understandably saying, but hang on a minute, we've changed it. It now specifically has to be phased. So what's going on here? Um, so the developer issued a legal challenge. There are actually sort of two main thrusts to the case. The first was, um, was the developer entitled to the phased payments at all? Um, ultimately, on the facts of this case, the court concluded that no, he wasn't. Because, and this is a sort of, it's quite a nuanced point, but it's actually something that's important to bear in mind. The developer's liability to pay was because he had assumed liability to pay, and it was triggered by the commencement of the development under the planning permission, not by the issue of the liability notice. And therefore, because he assumed liability to pay for a non-phased planning permission in 2018 and commenced in 2018, then regardless of when the liability notice was issued, that is in theory when he became due to pay the whole amount. Now then, going back to Mrs. Trent's case, could the developer have actually challenged his liability to pay on the basis that the liability notice was late? Um, but the developer didn't run that argument. So it would have been interesting to see what the court would have um, said about that. Mm. Um, the other aspect of the case is that the local planning authority, in effect, was arguing that the challenge should be thrown out summarily on the basis that the developer could have and should have asked for a review and a potential appeal under the regulations themselves. Um, the court didn't actually agree with that uh, because, and it's interesting because it's an instance where the court has um, been more liberal in its interpretation of the regulations, uh, but the court pointed out that um, whilst it is, uh, what, it is not a precondition to requesting a review of the amount of SIL for the liability notice to be issued, but ultimately the court I think quite reasonably and properly took the view that, but if the council has not issued the liability notice, then who do you know, how do you know whether you need to bring a review or not if the amount's not correct? Um, so it's sort of uh, everyone lost in that case, I think. Everyone um, lost, but if you're wanting to phase your sill, make sure you actually phase your planning permission. Sounds obvious, but, 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 but I clearly was missed, at least in that case. Well, look, I'm conscious I want to finish promptly today because for those watching the uh, the live broadcast, I'm, I'm determined we finish well in advance of 11 o'clock, it being Armistice Day, and I'm sure many will, will want to observe the silence. So let, let, let me just pull this together and come back to you both with, with one final question. What what would be your practical takeaway today for, for those who are wrestling with uh, with, with SIL and um, Tobias? Uh, Pick, pick you first, somewhat arbitrarily, but I'll put you on the spot. What, what's your, uh, the advantages, of course, though, you, you get to go first. So Peter might have to have a second <laughs> yeah. in case you pick his first. But uh, what, what, what would you say is the big takeaway for, for those trying to bring forward development or indeed those trying to process planning applications? Always go back to the regulations. Always look at what exactly the regulations say about what needs to be done, who needs to do it, how they need to do it, and when they need to do it. Because if you have a single misstep, um, there just isn't any sort of room for discretion and you bear the consequences. And that applies to both a developer or a local planning authority. Very sound advice. P Peter, I hope that wasn't what you were going to say. If it was, yeah, I hope you thought sure quickly enough. about what you were going to say. <laughs> sure, sure enough, he's taken what I was going to say. Um, uh, so I, I think for me, uh, phasing is, is, is an absolutely a critical one. And, and it's probably one that, that developers really need, do need to be alive to. If you're phasing your planning permission and, and you're doing it for the civil regulations, make sure that you're being absolutely clear that you're doing it for those purposes. So as not to get, to, to get stung with, with an early SIL hit. <laughs> 
sage words and I, I would probably add because neither of you have picked it but I would say time 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 be alive to the time limits to serve notices because the regulations are unforgiving on anyone who misses the uh, the, the time period to, for doing so whether you're collecting authority or the uh, or the landowner so what well, we'll look so th thank you both very much that's been um, an interesting discussion um, certainly from my perspective uh, even if it was about sill which i think i made clear from the start i'm not a fan of um, but uh, it's it's useful and, and interesting to start to uh, start to see what the courts are, are making of it. So thank you both very much. Um, as ever, thank you to to, to our listeners. Um, we hope that was useful. Um, the, this is our last outline of uh, of 2021. We'll be having a break for Christmas on the basis we suspect you've all got better things to do in December than listen to us talk about uh, the fascinating world of, of planning law. Um, we will be back in uh, in January though and I had uh, the plan originally was to tell you that we'd be talking looking looking back on 2021 and picking what we thought were some of our most significant and interesting planning cases of the last year but in fact as of yesterday Her Majesty gave royal assent to um, the Environment Act so for those who haven't spotted it yet we do now have a new Environment Act um, with some quite important changes for, for planning. So I suspect our January session will be looking at some of the planning related aspects of the uh, of, of the Environment Act, uh, an act that took over a thousand days from when it was first introduced into Parliament to actually make it onto the statute book. And uh, and yet still Parliament didn't manage to do it in time for us to get a session in on it on in 2021. So uh, we'll carry that over to 2022. But, but in the meantime, thank you to everyone again, and um, please do have a, a very happy Christmas. Look forward to seeing you in um, 2022. Thank you.